said, it's uh, before I get into the history of me, I want to touch briefly on the who I want to be at this moment and who I want to be in the future. Uh, and I'm not going to say no, Pastor. I've uh, I have fought the direction of God for way too long in my life. Um, I was sharing with Pastor this morning um, about an argument I, I was having with the direction of God yesterday. I'm driving to an auction. I loaded. It, I got a trailer and I'm headed. And I'm thinking, well, I'm going to stop at this uh, store that Benjamin and I like to get burritos at, and um, on the way to the auction. And so somebody had told me about some monster trucks, and I'm thinking. Benjamin would like to go to that, so I'm also driving down 180, and I'm looking, trying to find monster trucks on Facebook on my phone. But what I did find, didn't find any monster trucks, but what I did find is in 13 minutes, there was a men's breakfast at some church in Sanger. I don't know what church it is. I don't know anybody at that church, but I do know what road it's on because I bought a car on that road like three weeks ago. So I knew kind of about where it was at, and I knew, like, I hadn't yet come to Academy, so all I, I was... I was right there. And I'm like, no, I've got to get to the auction. I'm, these arguments that I have in my head. Um, well, why don't you go to this breakfast, Dave? Um, no, 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 I don't need to go. Mind you, I'm the only one in the car, but we're having a pretty good little argument. And, uh, you know, maybe you'll get something out of it. Nothing else, you get a free breakfast. That's very often good, good enough, huh? But, uh, so anyway, I got there, and... I had a very, a very great experience. I don't remember anybody's name because I have to know somebody for quite a while before I remember anybody's name. But, you know, a room full of brothers. And, and we had a great experience. And I was exactly where the Lord wanted me at that moment. And he has been trying to guide me and direct me for a long, long time. And for a lot of years, I fought that. Um, just kind of touching on uh, what Pastor Cheryl was talking about is the necessity of being crushed. You know, I, uh, out there in my life, in this testimony I'm going to share with you, there was a lot of things, situations, actions, words, situations that the Lord would have never chose for me. Um, I chose for myself. I have free will. He's given me that. And, uh, but through his action uh, of bringing me to this point, you know, I was crushed. I was crushed. And, uh, you know, I'm not quite that fine vintage of wine. I mean, maybe I'm about like a good bottle of Thunderbird. Uh, <laughs> hey, but, I, but I'm no longer the rotten fruit that I was. Yeah, there you go. And, and I have faith that if I continue to follow this path, you know, my, my vintage will uh, just get better and better. Yeah, um, so, also just touching, before I get into this, touching on what uh, Pastor Cheryl was talking about, coming across those people that, that were not discouraging, you know, recognizing that every person that the Lord has placed in my life, every single person in interaction, that person is a gift from God, that person is a teacher to me, that, that person is teaching me who I want to be or who I do not want to be. Maybe I can see it in you if I can't see it in myself. That's right. Uh, and so each person is a blessing. It's just a, it's my responsibility in it all to find the lesson. You know, what is that person here to teach? And also to recognize that the role is reversed. I, I serve a purpose in every one of your lives. Uh, you're going to either see in me, you know, the man I want you to see, or you're going to see in me, you know, maybe who I don't want to be. And on any given day, you know, I'm not 100%. I'm not. But the difference is today it matters to me. And so, uh, so I'm working on that. But anyway, so uh, starting at the beginning, you know, Grandma's house was right over here on Whitaker Way. Back end of uh, Jefferson School. Sorry about the bike there. Uh, Grandma's house was on Whitaker Way back in Jefferson School, and that was always part of my home life. You know, home was in different places, but Grandma's house was always solid. And, uh, you know, Grandma did her best to, you know, raise me with the direction of the Lord. And, and she did. 
that lady, she really tried. And she planted the seeds Amen. in me to where when it all fell down, I knew where to return to. There, there has never in my life been a question of, does God exist? It was a question of if, am I going to follow him? And I'm not going to say that it was ever a lesson that was taught to me, but I am going to say that it was a, the way I took it. In growing up, I was kind of of the belief that my perks or blessings or benefits from God and my relationship with God were going to come after my death, of which there are some. But I never really realized that I could benefit today from it, that I could benefit tomorrow from it while here on earth, you know. And again, I'm not saying anything about that church. No one ever told me that. It's just the way I perceived it. Um, so in, in growing up, you know, we all want to be important. And my first, I had a very first, very important job. I remember getting it at the age of four to five years old. And that was as a beer gopher. Do any of you guys know what a beer gopher is? That is the kid that's got to run and get somebody a beer. And, uh, you know, I stayed pretty busy doing that. Um, made me feel special. Made me feel important. Also had some twisted messages there. Let me know, hey, real man, drink beer. Real man, do some other things. Um, and, you know, as any good beer gopher would do, you know, I eventually started getting my own sip off the top. And, uh, you know, so there were a lot of messages in my life that, again, nobody ever intended that to be the message. It's just the way I took it. So unfortunately, my father died before we got to straighten a lot of those things out around the age of 12. And one of the things in my, in my career, I mean, I, I work in the substance abuse field and have for about 18 years. Um, 12 seems to be the magic number. 12 is where little boys go bad. And uh, oddly enough, I was 12 years old when my dad died. So anyway, so I don't have anybody there to correct me. My mom's always been great. I'm by no means saying anything bad about her, but she, she wasn't quite sure to what level to respond to me knowing that I had gone through, you know, the hurt of losing my dad. Um, so a lot of it was, a lot of it, well, the truth is, a lot of it she never knew. Um, but for those parts that she did know, she just kind of figured out boys will be boys and let they, they grow out of that. Um, well, I just kept growing further and further away. And I ended up, one of, one of the, the bad things that happened in that is I felt that I owed, so again, lost my dad. I felt that I owed it to him to be his father's son. But keep in mind, I had a big uh, twisted, I had the message twisted. Um, there are a lot of things that he would have just straight told me. No, let's not do it that way. Don't handle it that way. So, you know, I, I think I'm following his path. I think I'm following his direction, trying to fill those shoes. Um, had other examples in my life, tried to fill those shoes, and ended up way far away from the person that I really am. I mean, because all in all, you get to know me, I'm a pretty nice guy. Uh, even kind-hearted, you might say. <laughs> but, uh, but you wouldn't have been able to tell that in the 90s because I did everything I could to suppress who I really was and put on this mask of who I thought I needed to be to get respect in my lifestyle. Um, so a little bit about that lifestyle. You know, I got involved in gangs, got involved in the selling of drugs. Um, I was a definite problem in this community, um, without a doubt. And uh, there's a lot of that stuff that can't be fixed. And, and I'll, I'll get into my only version of a remedy, remedy 
later on in his testimony. But, uh, so, drifting further and further away from God, and one night, it was actually the night that my daughter was born. I remember, uh, I believe it's whatever street, I think it's M Street, where the theater is at. And it was October 14th, it was the night my daughter was born. Had the top down on the car, had the music playing. I'm on top of the world, you know, my first, my child's born and, and feeling great about things. And there's some individuals on the corner there that I don't get along with, but you know, this is a good day for me. So I'm not looking for problems and got the music playing. And then my buddy who was with me slapped me across the chest as we passed them. And that's just how easy I was influenced. Um, I'm pulling over like, okay. So yeah, I mean, I was, I was just so happy that I had this daughter of mine. So happy that, that I received this gift of God. I'm not looking for trouble, trying to stay out of trouble, just trying to be happy. All it took was a tap on the chest for me to go back and, and potentially lose it all, right? Um, fortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, that, that tap on the chest was followed by a go, 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 as they lit my car, I mean, started shooting. Um, could have been over that quick. So at that point in time, uh, it became, and there were some more examples, it became more and more clear how unprofitable and uh, that any type of a gang lifestyle was. Uh, unfortunately, I had a pretty good addiction at this point, so giving up on the drug part uh, wasn't so easy. Um, all throughout this testimony, there's going to be these versions of God was there. This with my daughter, that God was there. He never, he had never forsaken me. Um, so time goes on this, you know, for the first oh, four years of my daughter's life, I was unable to conquer that addiction. Um, incarcerations became more and more frequent, uh, which I consider every one of those a gift from God. I those were definitely God was there because that is the only way that I could stop. You know, there's, I did, a, I did several different programs and the one program I could never do was Salvation Army because Salvation Army makes you test clean before you go into their program. And if I'm on the streets, that's just not happening. Uh, just couldn't happen. So I had those interventions and, uh, my daughter would have to visit me through glass, and I had got out, and in the beginning of 2001, believe it or not, I was the better parent, and ended up with custody of my daughter, and was trying for a minute, and uh, a little bit unsuccessful at that. So I did have my daughter, and I remember we were driving to Orosi, and we saw the, the road crew on the side of the road, like picking up the trash. And uh, so remember when you used to have to visit me in there, honey? Because she remembered the jumpsuits that they were wearing. And she goes, yeah, but you're being a good boy now, huh? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm being a good boy. And so I dropped her off with my sister because the people I was going to meet, I didn't know. And, you know, being a good father, I am. I don't take her to the actual dope deal. I just take her to, you know, almost to the dope deal. And uh, so within a, within a half hour, I'm already pulling back into Bob Wiley. I'm in the back of the sheriff's car. Um, I had just done a pretty decent stretch. <coughs> of county time at Bob Wiley, ended up back in the same exact cell that I had left previously. And the first sincere prayer came from me. See, because I, I knew he was there, but that was the first time I truly called on him. And uh, 
keep in mind, I, I had been involved in my addiction for quite some time, so we also had my manipulations in play, which is, Lord, you know, I don't know who you created me to be or why you created me, but I know you didn't create me to be the occupant of this box, and I know when this box was created, you didn't have me in mind. Um, so for whatever the reason is that you created me, help me to find that. And also, if you could get me out of here, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he did. I had never been, I don't know if any of you guys know what OR means. OR means that they let you out of jail. See, nowadays it's really easy, to, like they let everybody out of jail all the time. Uh, at that time, it wasn't so much the case. You either pay your bail or stay in there. Or you get a ward sometimes, like if you seem like somebody they should trust. And I, on paper, didn't look like somebody they should trust. Um, but I got a ward, first time ever. And I went straight from there, straight to my buddy's house, straight to the back room, picked up a torch, picked up a pipe. And this conviction came upon me, this is your best? A straight shot here. And I put it down and I haven't picked it up since. And, um, you know, I've been clean and sober for over 21 years. Yeah. Uh, which then just brings me to picking up where I should have been all along. So now I'm at the age of 30 doing what I should have done at the age of 20. And, you know, got a little girl to support and rent to pay and gas and all this. So uh, a friend of mine encouraged me to go to school. And um, didn't really have a lot of faith in myself academically, but it turned out that I did all right in school. Um, a lot better than I did in high school because I was just a little bit more serious about it. Yeah. And uh, so I intentionally didn't go towards drug and alcohol education because that happens with a lot of people. I see it, I, I had seen it a lot. Somebody gets clean and then they want to do go to be a counselor and then they fall off and then that education is just wasted. And so I got all my general ed stuff out of the way first and I was still clean and I was still comfortable being clean and the Lord has still been blessing me because since that March 18th, 2001, we've always had a place to live. The lights have always been on. We've always had food in our stomach. There's always been gas in the car. There's always been tags and insurance on the car. There's always been employment and there's always been a means for me to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had done this internship and they told me in the beginning of this internship it was my first internship in a drug and alcohol treatment facility. They told me in the very beginning, just know that we don't have a job for you. No, know, know this ahead of time. Uh, and at that time I was still dressing like all of their clients and you know, I'm maybe not so much acting like it, but you put, put us all together. You don't know, you, you couldn't have picked me as some, any, Kind of professional. Um, I didn't let that hinder me. Uh, I still showed up early. I still stayed late. I, if they needed me for anything extra, I did it. And on the last day of my internship, they offered me a job, um, which was supposed to be what I was after, right? Um, and I had this reluctance, this, this seed of doubt placed by the enemy which was, if you ever go back doing time, when you get in there, because this whole thing working with inmates and your actions are gonna possibly, potentially send some of them back to custody. If you ever go back, you're gonna get it. They will get you. And so that doubt in myself had me hesitant to accept this job that I worked very hard to get. And you know, the Lord strengthened me at that moment. You're not going back. You, you got this, you're going to do this. And, and so I accepted the job and I haven't looked back. Um, and because what it all comes down to, I talked about how I had been part of a problem and, and I can't fix, I can't fix everything from the past, but what I can do is today, each person I speak to, each interaction I have, hey, I may not have much in any given day, but I'll give you what I've got. 
hey, some days I might come with a lot. You might not be ready for it then. But uh, I'm going to keep showing up. And since the beginning of this, I've been showing up. And, uh, you know, the, the Lord has allowed me to prosper. And I'm, when I talk about prosper, we're not talking about my Chase account. We are talking about the blessings that I have received in life. Uh, you know, I, going back to all these uh, messages I thought I understood growing up, which I didn't, you know, I now recognize the importance of being a father. You know, as a father, you're your kid's first teacher. Yes. Um, you're teaching your little boys how to grow up and be a man. You're teaching your little girls what to look for in a man. Um, and, and I take that pretty seriously. Um, so in regards to, yeah, I got that job working with inmates, worked in that place, went from the from client monitor to bottom of the barrel counselor to lead counselor, and then the budget crisis hit in 2010, and oh, the director left, everybody left. They had transferred me to another program. I couldn't leave that place. I'm boxing up stuff. For, for two weeks, I didn't show up to my new job. And they're like, what, what are you doing over there, David? Well, I've got to take care of this. I've I got to get all this. I've got to get every last thing taken care of. Sometimes, i got to be kicked out of the door. You know, I get comfortable in a place where, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. <clears throat> but the Lord has different seasons for us. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and sometimes I really do have to be pushed, kicked out of the door, like go to the next place. Um, and that's what took place there. And they switched me to another program to kind of be lead on a mental health contract, and that contract fell through. So just let me on. Which opened the door for the next place that I did really need to be which was working with a population that I had no desire to work with, which were teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they gave me a coordinator position in Reedley Continuation, uh, doing drug and alcohol treatment for the kids out there. My daughter happened to be a teenager at Reedley High School. Um, my daughter wasn't in any problems, and so I did have to make it clear to them that I would not do any substituting at Reedley High School because she was entitled to her high school experience without my intervention. Right. Unless something went wrong, and I'll get involved. Yeah. But, <laughs> such a blessing to work with those teenagers, because it was by no means just, uh, it was by no means just drug and alcohol education. It was working with people that were at the place in life exactly where I went bad. You know, and the opportunity to catch some of them before or some of them shortly after, um, you know, was the next place that the Lord had for me. Now, I know the Lord only wanted me there for a season or else he would have provided a little greater financial incentive. Uh, because each month as we went, as I went through there, I'm losing money, I'm losing money, I'm losing money, and I'm staying faithful to it. The opportunity for the next job came along, I applied. And by the time I went to Pavarola House, by the time I got a first check from Pavarola House, I had $8 left in my savings. Uh, everything was gone, I had sold my toys, and, and we're, you know, we were in disaster mode, and I had $8 left by the time I received my first paycheck. And Pavarola House, again, was, that's kind of like my cup of tea, it's the criminal justice type population. And um, this is where, again, the Lord would have never, he did not create me to be the, the man in that box, but he can sure use that. Yes. He can sure use everything I learned while I was living on the other side of the fence as a tool to bring glory to him because I was created by him and I was created for him to bring glory to him. Amen. Amen. There you go. And uh, 
So, you know, I was at Pavarola House for 10 years and a great many blessings and I've entered a new season of my life. Uh, just got started uh, working in another program that it has been a staple in this community for 50 years and had gone out of business a few years back and getting to open the doors back up for that. And that's, again, I don't know if it's my last assignment. I don't know. I do know that I'm going to do my best because I recognize that about myself that when the Lord pushes me, I'm stubborn, you know. Sometimes I don't think I'm the only stubborn man in this room. Uh, I try to listen and things are getting better. And, you know, I wish I had some spectacular conclusion of the, of my testimony here today, but the truth is it's not over yet. That's right. Um, right. There you go. So right. I'm just going to have a brief pause because we're, at the beginning of the next chapter, and I'll let you know how that goes. Ah. <laughs>